Thank you very much. Thank you for the invitation. Uh, it's an honor to be here, and it's an honor to be back to the real world. So in my presentation, I will be speaking of, uh, I will be concentrating on autoimmune diseases. Oh. Okay, this is how this works. So when it comes to autoimmune diseases, uh, we have two major questions. Uh, the first question is uh, what are the major factors underlying uh, the autoimmune diseases? Uh, and then the next one is what are the diseases or uh, what are the disease groups to be speaking of? And uh, the third one is that um, why does a PKD work and in these conditions and uh, how we can reverse these conditions. So the same here, I think here. I think I do not have a pointer. Okay, anyway, so the first factor. So we believe that uh, these are the three major factors underlying the development of autoimmune, uh, generally uh, chronic diseases. First one is the overconsumption of carbohydrates which is resulting in obesity, type 2, diabetes, and uh, any uh, metabolic syndrome-related diseases. And uh, if a patient starts applying a PKD, paleolithic ketogenic diet, uh, this will reverse the overconsumption of carbohydrates, and that's the mechanisms of action, how this works. Uh, then the second underlying cause is the foods that are causing an increased intestinal permeability and an increased permeability of other membranes uh, within our body. And this is the cause that is uh, responsible for uh, a wide array of autoimmune diseases and cancer. And since the PKD is excluding these food items, uh, there is a way to reverse this condition by this exclusion. And the third one are the food additives, uh, which may be the major factor behind epilepsy, panic disorder, and cardiac arrhythmia. The PKD is excluding these items, therefore these conditions may be <coughs> reversed uh, by uh, eliminating this third factor. So uh, this is, of course, not uh, a fully one-to-one -one correspondence because uh, there may be factors that may be resulting in more diseases or disease groups or behind one single disease like epilepsy, there may be carbohydrate overconsumption and food additives as well. But, but this is a general scheme uh, that connects uh, a cause and the resulting disease. Oops. Okay, in this presentation, I will be focusing on this middle one, uh, foods that are causing a pathological permeability of the intestines, uh, and these are the autoimmune diseases and cancer, and here I will be concentrating on the autoimmune diseases. Uh, so, uh, we are using a, a diet that we um, <coughs> call the PKD, the paleolithic ketogenic diet, and <coughs> this is basically uh, a meat fat based diet uh, that is based on four legged animals. There is a specific ratio between the meat and the fat, and it also includes organs, organ meat. So, this is the easiest way how we can define this diet. And this is basically two forms of the diet. On the left, you can see a full meat fat based uh, diet that is lacking any, anything else, any plant food component. And on the right, you can see a more relaxed version that allows for some vegetable or some fruits uh, in moderation and only certain ones. There's a continuum between the two. So the, the one on the left is for those who have a autoimmune disease or any more complicated diseases or coming from a background uh, that involves um, medications. Um, this is the way to start with. The right one is for those who who just want a diet for prevention or for those who already recovered uh, from a more serious disease. Uh, <clears throat> the intestinal permeability, is, uh, which is also called the leaky gut, uh, is a key. Uh, is it better? <laughs> so uh, the intestinal permeability is a key behind autoimmune diseases. Uh, 
in order to understand the concept, you need to know that uh, the intestine has a dual function. It is functioning uh, as absorption, and it is also functioning uh, as a barrier between uh, the gut, between the content of the gut and the rest of the body. And the combination of the two is resulting in something called selective permeability. Uh, so any transport of any nutrients or food items uh, is occurring in a very selective way and a highly regulated way. The first question is uh, what is affecting intestinal permeability? What are the consequences and how we can reverse uh, and increase intestinal permeability? It has been acknowledged that uh, if we could reverse and increase intestinal permeability, then we were able to cure a wide array of autoimmune diseases. So this was uh, basically concluded in this article on the right. Uh, but there has been no really good idea on how we can indeed reverse uh, increase intestinal permeability. There have been a few experimental trials and a few other ideas from somewhere else, uh, but none of them proved to be a really good, good tool to reverse intestinal permeability. And this includes probiotics, prebiotics, colostrum, um, FODMAP diets or other diets, fecal transplantation, none of them really worked. For example, here is this study uh, from 2014. Uh, this was a study where they used a regular paleo diet, which actually looked like here on the right upper corner. This is a regular paleo diet. When they looked at the effect of this diet on several health parameters, including uh, intestinal permeability and inflammation level and many others. And it was found that the diet had a positive effect on weight, glucose control, waste, circumference, so basically metabolic parameters, but there was no positive effect on increased intestinal permeability or the inflammation level. So this is crucial because inflammation and the leaky gut is at the core of the autoimmune diseases. If you can read that any diet has a positive effect on some parameters, it doesn't mean that the same diet will have the potential to um, uh, recover any more serious autoimmune diseases. And this is what we can see in our practice too. So several benefits, but if it is not affecting the core of the diet, then it will not cure autoimmune diseases. So, Actually, the very first evidence that an uh, elevated intestinal permeability was normalized by any intervention uh, came from our case study here on the right. This was published in 2016. This is how the intestinal permeability is measured. We use a test uh, that is called the PEG or PEG test. Uh, for measuring intestinal permeability. You can see that the first measurement uh, was done at four months on a diet in a Crohn's disease patient, a very advanced Crohn's disease patient. He was just before um, a surgery after a long course of the disease. You can see that the first measurement in red was still high. Uh, and the second measurement that was done at 10 months on the PKD uh, was already uh, back to the normal range. So the, basically the PEG test uh, is using a solution of the so-called PEG molecules with 11, 11 different sizes, and um, they calculate the recovery of this molecule in the urine, and that's how the permeability is calculated, and everything is plotted uh, on a graph. Anything that is outside, anything that is above uh, the upper uh, dotted line is, is uh, regarded to be high. So it is expected uh, that intestinal permeability in an ideal situation goes back to the normal range, which, which is between the two dotted lines. So going back to the case, uh, along with this um, reversal of elevated intestinal permeability, 
uh, it was found that uh, the ultrasound picture of the ultrasound uh, of, the, of the intestine normalized. So this is basically about thickening of the intestine, which basically means inflammation, edema. Uh, this normalized. Um, then uh, we followed the patient with uh, laboratory blood works and we saw an improvement and actually a full, a complete normalization of the laboratory blood parameters, including inflammation levels. Uh, the patient also became symptom freedom uh, and medicine freedom was achieved too. Um, this is a more detailed representation of the, of the inflammation level. Um, on the top, you can see uh, the treatment that the patient was receiving. So here you can see the first part that was uh, done while doing a standard diet. Uh, and the second part on the, red, uh, on the, on the right, you can see uh, how PKD affected inflammation levels. You can see CRP and ESR. Maybe I can. Can you help me go and look? <laughs> Thank you. Sorry, it, it was just so uncomfortable. <laughs> oh, yeah, more or less, more or less. I go back. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Don't look at the screen. Just look at the monitor. Okay. <laughs> Okay, okay, I will do. Uh, so we have uh, the, the two major inflammation markers, CRP and ESR, and as you can see on the standard treatment uh, that also uh, included anti-inflammatory treatment, uh, the inflammation levels were higher as compared to uh, the PKD, were much fluctuating too. Uh, and, and, and this on the right side show uh, what has happened after the publication of this case study. You can see that inflammation level went further down. Currently, this patient is one of the longest, is, is, is the one with one of the longest follow-ups. He is on the PKD for seven years. He is about to finish medical university, by the way and he's completely disease-free and medicine-free. So he's about to finish medical university and he already knows how to recover a Crohn's disease. Okay, we can also say that this case study was a milestone case study because uh, based on the results of uh, this case, the PKD was included in the Polish Pediatric Gastroenterology Society guidelines as one of the potential diets that may have a positive effect on Crohn's disease or any other inflammation, uh, inflammatory bowel disease, uh, which is kind of a big thing because uh, these case studies or these cases do not uh, really get their way uh, into the standard academic medicine. Okay, back to the PEG test. We have been measuring uh, PEG for measuring intestinal permeability since 2015. Initially, we had a collaboration uh, with the Biolab company in London. And then from 2017, we have been working on developing our own fathered methodology uh, with a PEG test. Uh, and unfortunately, our colleague uh, Peter Meris passed away at some point, and then uh, we started doing um, we, we started doing another collaboration uh, with the Department of Applied Chemistry in uh, Debrecen, which is um, other medical university in Hungary. Um, collectively, we have been measuring several hundreds of uh, PEC tests for intestinal permeability. Uh, most of which we also know the background, so what the disease is associated. So we know many data that is being associated and we can do a few um, conclusions. Uh, what we can conclude is that the, if the PKD is properly applied, then the initially elevated intestinal permeability normalizes. Uh, here we can see healthy controls 
you can see the first measurement uh, that was done while still following the initial diet, uh, which was the healthy, con uh, which, which was the paleolithic diet in the first subject, and in the second and in the fourth subject, it was the Western type diet. You can see that intestinal permeability was high in all three cases. Then uh, patients or subjects were started uh, on a PKD, and as you can see, three or four weeks later, intestinal permeability went back to the normal range. We have a third measurement here in this first subject that was done at one year on the PKD, and it is farther down. And this is happening um, like a rule if somebody is indeed following PKD, regardless of the background, almost regardless of the background where the patient is coming from, um, and I mean uh, disease-wise, or whatever other diet the patient may have been following. So these are the conditions that we have the most experience with the most patients, uh, and these are the ones um, I will be speaking of and uh, showing you data about. Here is a second case. I already showed you one. This is a second case. This was a more complicated case as he had a non-Hodgkin lymphoma with several complications. Uh, then he was diagnosed with Crohn's disease in 2005. He developed multiple uh, complications, including multiple abscesses, and um, he received several surgeries because of these abscesses. In uh, 2016, he started a PKD and he achieved complete recovery. He became completely uh, symptom-free. The abscesses healed in a few months and he became, and he's still uh, medicine-free. So let's look at the inflammation. Uh, again, on the left-hand side, you can see the CRP and the ESR measurements that were done while on the standard diet, standard treatment. On the right, you can see PKD and no medicine. As you can see, data or, or measurements are much higher on the standard um, <clears throat> approach as compared to the PKD. Here is a... Um, statistical comparison of, uh, of the most important laboratory parameters. There are even more, but I, these are the most important ones. And um, out of these ones, I, I will uh, show you these three. First one is the WC, white blood cell number, which it can also be regarded as one of the inflammation markers, and it went back to more or less the half. Uh, then we have the CRP. The CRP went back to one-fourth of the original average. And then we have the folate, the third one, the folate increased by threefold. And, and this is something interesting here uh, because this is something that you cannot achieve with a regular carnivore diet because in order to have a good folate level or catch up uh, with a folate, you need to eat organ meats which is a must to do on the PKD. And uh, when I'm speaking about folate or any other vitamins, uh, I also mean uh, many other related vitamins because vitamin levels are correlated with each other. So when we are speaking of folate, we should also keep in mind that we are also speaking of vitamin C and a few other vitamins that are collectively reflected in folate and vitamin D levels. Okay, uh, on to type 1 diabetes. So this is a, uh, a quick overview to show you how PKD relates to the standard treatment and any other low-carb approach. So uh, let's start uh, with the standard care, which is, of course, life-saving, but it is not a cure, actually. They are substituting something that is missing. They are substituting a hormone but it is not a cure. And standard academic medicine is regarding type 1 diabetes as incurable because of this. Then we have a, a more general low-carb, high-fat diet, the content of which may be quite variable. Uh, we can say that this is 
providing a partial cure. Uh, it is resulting in a much better glucose control. It is allowing for decreasing insulin, and it is also able to prevent hypoglycemic uh, episodes in a patient. So let's call it as a partial cure. If you look at uh, the column with the PKD, you can see that the benefit list is longer. In addition to the three major benefits with the low-carb, high-fat diet, we can also achieve inflammation control and we can achieve preventing long-term complications that usually come along with type 1 diabetes. And um, on the top of this, we can also say that uh, the PKD is curative in new onset type 1 diabetes cases because it is able to restore the own insulin production. This may not be the case with those uh, who have a long-lasting uh, diabetes. So these are the first two published cases with a PKD where we showed that there is a possibility to restore the own insulin production. It is not possible with any other intervention, as far as we know. Um, we, have, uh, we have showed this uh, by measuring the, the so-called C-peptide, because the C-peptide is, si is signifying the own insulin production. Here you can see uh, the, the pro-insulin, uh, which is cleaved into the C-peptide and the insulin in a one-to-one -one ratio. That's why uh, it is possible to measure C-peptide uh, instead of measuring the insulin. So we are concentrating on C-peptide and how C-peptide changes after starting the diet. This is how glucose levels uh, were after starting the PKD. You can see that glucose levels were very stable and low as compared to the insulin regime and high-carb diet. Uh, this is sustainable as long as the patient is following the PKD. Uh, what we see in the long term is that there is an increase or at least uh, a stabil stabilization of the C-peptide. Uh, usually there is an increase as compared to what was measured at diagnosis onset. So these measurements here are a few months apart from each other. There is an increase in most of the cases. Here are other cases where the same thing happened. Uh, but there is a minority of patients where we um, realize that there is an apparent drop in the C-peptide. And uh, interestingly enough, this was seen in those patients who very highly adhere to the diet. So we were wondering whether this effect is because of eating a, a lower and lower and lower carbohydrate content diet. And that's why less insulin is produced. That's why less C-peptide is measured. So we need uh, to find out how we can distinguish with this phenomenon from the autoimmune destruction uh, of the insulin production, producing cells in the, in the pancreas. So for this reason, we introduced another measurement, which we call the stimulated C-peptide. So we measure two C-peptides, one fasting, and uh, which is paired with a stimulated one. The stimulated one only means that the patient is taking a regular breakfast with him or her and eat, is eating the, 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 the PKD breakfast and then goes uh, for a second measurement. Um, and as you can see, uh, the C-peptide, which is um, um, pictured in, in, in red, is always higher than... This is, of course, not a surprise, but uh, this is um, indicating that this is a very good tool to measure the both, because the combination of the two uh, is, is uh, providing a, a much real picture of the own insulin production. Usually, we measure the stimulated C-peptide one hour uh, after having the breakfast. This is a case when uh, we measured it at one hour and two hours. So there is a further dynamics that may be happening. But anyways, uh, the interesting thing is that the stimulated C-peptide is always uh, in the normal range. The, the red dotted line is representing the low end of the normal range. Which means that if there is a need to produce insulin, uh, these patients are able to produce their own insulin. And a few other cases, um, these are, uh, this, the, on the left-hand side, this is a child and an adult woman. 
uh, C-peptide is preserved, plus there is an additional increase when we measure stimulated C-peptide. And, and, and this, is, this is the case basically with, with each and every newly diagnosed type 1 diabetes patient. On to the LADA, late onset autoimmune diabetes. Um, this patient uh, was first put on a standard approach, as it used to be the case. Uh, then he, just by himself, find, found out uh, that the carnivore diet would help him, so he moved on with the carnivore diet, and in another two months, he started the PKD, and along with this, he gradually decreased his insulin on his own. Uh, we started our our regular two weeks follow-up program. So we always have a follow-up uh, with those patients who, are, who we are consulting with because there is a need to give um, a, a close surveillance and the feedback to these patients. Here you can see the glucose and the ketone levels uh, during the two weeks. As you can see, uh, glucose was relatively low and the patient achieved and maintained ketosis Currently, this patient is still insulin-free uh, already for two years. This is another representation of the glucose levels. So here uh, you can see four months. The first half is the carnivore diet. The second half is the PKD. Uh, here you can see uh, the black bars are indicating the insulin doses that were used and once on the PKD, uh, the patient stopped using the remaining insulin. Uh, if you look at the colors, the, the red colors are uh, representing the high blood glucose levels, the blue ones are representing the lows, uh, and, um, and the vertical scale is representing time uh, of the day in a 24-hour resolution. As you can see, that the, the red color is fading into blue, which is kind of reflecting a tendency towards having lower blood uh, sugar levels, despite of the fact uh, that the patient stopped using insulin. So we can, we can say that there is a further improvement uh, after starting the PKD, and, and this may last as long as a few months. The recovery is going on, obviously. Here is another phenomenon um, on the left button side, uh, do we recognize what this phenomenon is? Left button, this red patch, left upper, le right patch. This is, yes, this is don't phenomenon. And we very often see this uh, with a carnivore diet or in patients who are taking excess insulin, more insulin than they need or anybody who usually have a higher blood glucose level. And this phenomenon also fades away if somebody is uh, closely following the PKD. Okay, this is how the C-peptide uh, production was. You can see both fasting and stimulated C-peptide remained stable. Okay, let's go on with the autoimmune um, hypo, uh, I think this is, uh, this is a hypo, uh, hypothyreosis, like uh, Hashimoto. Uh, in this case, uh, disease, uh, this patient already had uh, Hashimoto for 16 years, and she was on thyroid medication for 12 years. She had high anti-TPO levels. And these are the treatments, alternative treatments that uh, she was trying out without a major effect. So she was started on the PKD, and here you can see the incoming numbers and um, score of the symptoms as we see uh, at our interface. We do have an online interface to follow up patients. The patients have another uh, interface to look at. Um, anyways, this is the summary of the incoming data across the two weeks. As you can see, both glucose and ketones were stabilized in the target range. The target range is uh, having a blood glucose levels of no more than 4.5 or no more than 80. Blood ketones should be at least two. As you can see, the weight was going down. Uh, the patient already started the PKD a few weeks before, 
uh, even if this was not a perfect version of the PKD, but symptoms already improved and there was a minor further improvement while we were doing the follow-up. And on the right button uh, corner, you can see how levothyroxine was tapered down, uh, tapering down. Thyroid supplementation is, all, is only possible if you have a day-by-day -day feedback from the patient and it is assist assisted by uh, laboratory blood works. At least two blo uh, laboratory blood works are needed. Here is a small disclaimer on the bottom. Uh, hypothyroidosis cases may be very different. One may be very different from another one, depending on where you are coming from, the dose of your medication, the type of your medication. So do not try to uh, repeat this, because this may not apply for you if you have hypothyroidosis. Uh, and the opposite disease, the autoimmune hyperthyroidism, is Graves' disease. This is a newly diagnosed Graves' disease with high uh, Graves-related antibodies. She was immediately started on metamizole sodium. This patient also had other autoimmune conditions. And <clears throat> these are the symptoms, strong palpitations, elevated heart rate, uh, autophony, popping uh, of the ears, tightness of the throat and uh, sleep loss and anxiety. And these are the results during the two weeks follow-up. As you can see, ketones elevated in the target range, glucose remained relatively low. And here are the resulting uh, symptoms. As you can see, there is some fluctuation in the symptom, but overall there has been a decrease. Uh, you need to know that with the Graves' disease, two weeks is, n is not enough. Uh, to recover from a Graves disease, it takes a much longer time as compared to autoimmune uh, hypothyreosis, so a longer follow-up is needed, and many more blood works are needed because uh, these measurements uh, are changing much slower. So you can see that originally the TSH was very low, it was suppressed, as it used to be the craze with Graves disease, and it took uh, six weeks before the TSH went back to the normal range. So anything that is lower than expected or ideal is, is highlighted in blue. Anything higher than expected is highlighted in pink. So it took six weeks uh, before the TSH went back to the standard normal range. And uh, in, in the top row, you can see how uh, the metamizole, the anti-Graves medication was tapered down each tapering steps should be assisted again by day-by-day -day feedback and the blood work. So uh, a visual representation of the same thing uh, in, in, uh, in, in um, orange, you can see how metamizole was tapered down slowly, gradually, and alongside how TSH went back to the normal range. And this was possible only, of course, by doing a PKD. In itself, it is not possible at all. Okay, last disease, juvenile rheumatoid arthritis. This was a young child, six years old. Um, she already had a few years of disease history. Uh, when, she, when we first met her, she was on two medications, Embrel and Methotrexate. She was taking supplements and uh, she was following a standard, all the gluten-free diet. At the start of the PKD, um, her mother reported that she's getting tired very quickly. Uh, she had hip and tooth pain, uh, her, her joints were swollen, she had edema uh, throughout the body, she had skin reaction uh, where the injection was given to her. She was very nervous, she had elevated uh, pulse and she had restless -like legs during the night. So this is one disease and a list of symptoms. Uh, at two weeks, the mother reported that the energy level is much better. She reported that there is much less pain, no edema, uh, the swollen knees is gone. At three weeks, uh, she reported that the small child is not complaining um, about anything. And this is uh, what the blood works showed. Uh, the control blood work at one month. We are always doing a comprehensive blood work at one month after starting the PKD, uh, show that each and every parameter was uh, in the expected range, which is a good feedback that the child was adhering uh, to
to what uh, she was expected to follow diet-wise. Uh, in the middle, you can see that here are, uh, elevate, here are elevated liver enzymes, which was very likely the result of the medication that the patient was prescribed. So these prescription medications are mean uh, a, a chemical toxicity. Uh, since she was doing PKD, this enabled tapering down the medication, and as a result, uh, liver enzymes normalized too, which was good news for her uh, caring physician. Um, why it is important uh, to use a diet approach if you have an autoimmune disease? First, because there is no other cure for autoimmune diseases. Autoimmune diseases are regarded as incurable. And the second reason is that if you have one autoimmune disease, you are very prone to develop a second one. So here you can see how autoimmune diseases follow each other um, in children. So the first autoimmune condition we, we often see is just an eczema. We do not care about it. Then the patient or the small child may develop allergy and then a third one, asthma and Crohn's and type one diabetes or type one diabetes and Crohn's. This is a very, this is a scenario that we very often see in children as they are growing up. Okay, uh, this is just a quick summary of what you can achieve with a PKD in autoimmune diseases. So the PKD, if properly uh, effectuated, holds the autoimmune process that is going on, that has been going on it is resulting in a complete recovery in most autoimmune conditions. And I only showed you a few diseases and just a few cases, uh, but when I am uh, presenting the case, there are dozens of other successful patients uh, on which I, I am uh, basing my conclusions on. In type one diabetes, uh, those with a new, uh, with new diagnosis, uh, insulin freedom is possible and it is possible to restore the own insulin production. In long-lasting cases, it is possible to prevent long-term complications and it's possible to decrease the external insulin. Uh, you will be able to enjoy the benefits of the PKD so far you are following the PKD. This may sound obvious, uh, but um, when we are interacting with patients, we have to remind patients um, all the time that this is the case. And there may be some cases or diseases less severe or more or less recovered diseases uh, where a broader version of the PKD uh, may be enough. Okay, and I would like to take the opportunity to introduce you this book, which uh, came out just recently. This was uh, put together by my colleague, uh, Natalie Daniels, who is one of our dietary assistant. So she compiled uh, this book, uh, which is a practical guide to PKD for those who are about to start or would like to learn more about uh, the PKD. And, and this is a very, very practical book. So this will be hopefully of help those who, who need something like this in their own kitchen. I, I have a copy with me so you can, uh, have a look at it if you have the time. Yes, and I, I think that's it. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Sofia Clements.